If you don't know, my name is David Riley and I'm the Chair of Medical Education here. And this is the Ask the Doctor series. And my topic today is cardiovascular complications of Parkinson's disease. And this is a very uh, narrow topic within the field of Parkinson's disease. We're really going to be coning down today on a very specific aspect of the experience of having Parkinson's, but it's one that I think uh, is important to discuss because it's, it happens to be very common uh, even though uh, a lot of people don't know about it yet, I think the momentum is building because there's a lot of accumulating knowledge in this area that people are going to become aware of it and realize that they are experiencing some symptoms along these lines. <clears throat> so we're in the domain of the non-motor manifestations of Parkinson's. We talked about the classic motor manifestations, the tremor, the rigidity, the increased muscle tone, the difficulty with voluntary movement, the slowness and stiffness, and so on. And here we're talking about non-motor aspects of Parkinson's disease, which uh, we've previous, previously discussed in this forum and broken down into different subcategories because over the last 25 years we've accumulated so much knowledge in this area that we really have to, in order to keep it organized, subcategorize it. Uh, and so we've talked about cognitive and psychiatric aspects. And here we're going to de be dealing with the autonomic nervous system and just one small aspect of the autonomic nervous system. Um, and the autonomic nervous system is the part of the nervous system that functions autonomously, that is to say without conscious control. Uh, and all of these uh, functions of the autonomic nervous system are governed by a series of reflexes that basically execute uh, actions, compensatory actions for our body's well-being uh, on our behalf without our conscious uh, knowledge. They kind of function like a thermostat uh, in, in your house. You don't have to um, you don't have to readjust the 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 uh, the furnace or anything else, the air conditioning or anything else. You set a desired temperature, and the system takes care of it for you. Uh, and all of these are part of the autonomic nervous system. Uh, the the bodily functions that we really aren't under necessarily under our conscious control. So we're going to be honing in here on the cardiovascular complications. Uh, of uh, Parkinson's disease. So what does cardiovascular mean? Well, cardiovascular is a compound word made up of a couple of different items. Cardio being the heart, uh, and most of you are familiar with that from exercise lingo. Uh, and vascular is a term that we use to mean blood vessels. And the whole of them together make up the so-called circulatory system, the heart being the muscular pump that drives blood through, and the blood vessels being those vessels that take blood to and from every part of our body because all of the cells of our body need uh, replenishment. And so the, um, the blood picks up uh, oxygen in the lungs, picks up energy in the intestinal area, and then disperses that throughout the body because all of our cells, all of our cells need some supply of oxygen and nutrients to continue to function. So, the cardiovascular system is also known as the circulatory system, and we're talking about blood circulation here. Uh, and uh, the, it's easy to keep in mind, or, or, or helpful to keep in mind, I think, the fact that this is simply a pump and pipe system, uh, if you will, like you have... Um, What's a good analogy for that? If you have an older heating system, for example, and you have steam heat uh, in your radiators and that pumps throughout your house, uh, you have a, a pump somewhere in the basement that drives all the, the steam through all the different uh, rooms of the house, brings it back to reheat the fluid uh, and so on, and it's a similar kind of uh, idea to that. Any type of thing, your automobile has a number of uh, fluid systems as well, where there's a pump that drives the fluid all the way through through, and then it's re recycled to be used again. So uh, thinking of the cardiovascular system as a pump and pipe system I think is very helpful uh, in terms of illustrating its function with respect to the brain and to Parkinson's disease. 
But of course, for the nervous system, the part that we're really interested in is the ability of the cardiovascular system to supply blood to the brain. Uh, and in fact, that, as far as the nervous system is concerned, is the prime function of the circulatory system is keep me supplied with oxygen, keep me supplied with sugar and other nutrients uh, so I can do what I need to do uh, because, of course, the brain is the most important organ in the body, um, <coughs> says the brain. Um, and, and the heart says, well, without me, you can't function, so. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, keeping the blood supply to the brain is what drives the brain to tell the, tell the, the circulatory system what to do. Now, if we were uh, spent all of our time in bed to horizontally, uh, supplying the brain with blood would be no problem whatsoever. However, it just so happens that as we humans are designed, our brain is located at the very top of the system. Most of our waking time is spent either seated or standing so that the brain is placed at the highest level of our body. And because of gravity, and gravity does act on blood just like any other non-fixed uh, item, uh, gravity acts on blood and would pull the blood down into our lower bodies, into our legs, and into our abdomen if we allowed it to do so. And it's the heart's job to counteract that, or the circulatory system's job, I'm sorry, to counteract that, not just the heart, but the heart and the blood vessels, because the blood vessels have an active role in this as well. We modify our blood vessels to ensure that there's enough blood to circulate to the top part of our body and that it doesn't all get drawn down into the lower part of our body by gravity. Uh, so, uh, the ability of humans to maintain an upright posture is largely dependent on the fact that we have developed these, uh, this circulatory system, uh, that we have this circulatory system that can maintain the blood flow to the brain at all times. So, uh, the design of our circulatory system uh, contains a lot of reflexes and other design features that are geared toward preserving blood supply to the brain. And the reflexes can involve the heart and can involve the blood vessels. So what does the heart do? The heart can speed up so it can beat more times per minute and that will accelerate blood flow and that will increase circulation. Or it can uh, contract more forcefully. The, the heart doesn't completely empty every time that uh, it squeezes blood out into the rest of the body, uh, but it can, uh, uh, it can contract more forcefully and drive a greater percentage of blood out with each heartbeat as well. So the force of the contraction, as well as the number of contractions per unit of time per minute, for example, can be increased or decreased as uh, determined by uh, our nervous system uh, in terms of its needs. And what does the peripheral uh, blood vessel vasculature do? So that's the heart, the blood vessels. We have a, a tiny little sheath of musculature surrounding uh, blood vessels, particularly arteries, that um, can can clamp down on the caliber of the vessels, make for a narrow passageway, and of course, the narrower the passage, the smaller the volume of blood is uh, contained, stored in the uh, blood vessels, and by clamping down on our blood vessels, we can ensure that more blood is returned to the heart and available to be pumped up toward the brain. So, uh, there's a number of different systems. I'm not gonna get into the uh, sp specific anatomy and the chemistry and so on. That is, that'll, that'll bore you to tears, but the point is that there are multiple points at which the uh, circulatory system uh, modifies itself to meet the needs of blood flow. When these systems fail, then there becomes inadequate blood supply to the brain, and that's going to be the topic of uh, the lecture today, uh, of the clinical part of the lecture today, because this is where uh, Parkinson's disease uh, affects our cardiovascular system. So the maintenance of blood pressure is uh, a, a number of different functions. I've listed only a couple of them here, uh, one being the rate and the force of the contraction of the heart and the caliber of the blood vessels as I've just outlined. 
We designate people who have a blood pressure that is considered too high, uh, and that number is a moving target. Uh, many of you have read in recent years that the, um, the ideal blood pressure has been ratcheted down uh, uh, in recent years in terms of um, too high a blood pressure reflecting a risk for uh, heart attacks and strokes, uh, uh, kidney disease, uh, other organs that are vulnerable to damage from too high a pressure of blood at, at a constant time. So um, the, the, um, the number uh, it varies according to different sources, but uh, the, the main thing for you to know is that there has been a trend in recent years for the ideal blood pressure to be lower and lower. Consequently, more people are being diagnosed with hypertension all the time, and more people are being treated for high blood pressure um, because the threshold for high blood pressure has been lowered. Hypotension is the opposite of hypertension. Even though the two words are very similar to each other, uh, they mean the opposite. Hypo means too little, hyper means too much. And that, uh, that is um, a, a, a prefix that uh, is, is used throughout medicine. Here we're talking about blood pressure, so hypotension is too low a blood pressure. <clears throat> A lot of what I'm going to be able to tell you today is based on the fact there have been some new technologies developed for us to monitor uh, the blood pressure uh, and uh, look at the innervation of the heart. So a couple of tests I'm just going to mention here, 24, ambulatory, 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that people are wearing a device that monitors their blood pressure throughout a 24 hour day. Uh, and that ambulatory simply means while they're up and around and pursuing their normal level of activities. So rather than the long-standing technology of taking of somebody blowing up a blood pressure cuff and measuring your blood pressure at a certain point in time, uh, these machines every 15 minutes will take the blood pressure and keep a record of how somebody's blood pressure fluctuates over the course of a whole day. Uh, and that gives us a whole lot more information than taking some random uh, uh, reading at any point in time about the blood pressure. Uh, this will be better illustrated than, uh, than explained in words. Uh, <clears throat> what we have learned is that we know that blood pressure regulation is governed by a system of reflexes that start up in the brain. The brain, of course, being the seat of uh, our ability to control every aspect of our bodily function. Uh, and this is just a diagram of the uh, progression of pathology in Parkinson's disease according to the Brock hypothesis. Hugo Brock is a German pathologist who has outlined this sequence of pathology which uh, is uh, should be taken as a rough guideline. It certainly doesn't apply to everybody. Not everybody follows the same course. Uh, as you well know, just from your own experience, people have different symptoms of Parkinson's disease and they experience them at different times. <laughs> so there's no set formula that everybody follows. But this is a helpful conceptual basis on which to show simply what I want to show here was that the, uh, the, um, the Lewy body pathology that affects Parkinson's disease in the motor system can affect many other parts of the brain, including uh, various aspects of the autonomic nervous system, uh, including blood pressure. So um, uh, blood pressure regulation is uh, un undoubtedly affected by the uh, brain pathology that we see uh, in people with Parkinson's. <clears throat> but in recent years, a number of studies have documented also that the peripheral nervous system is also affected, at least as far as the heart is concerned, in people with Parkinson's disease. So what we're seeing here are um, two uh, MIBG studies, and MIBG, MIBG is a marker for um, norepinephrine releasing uh, nerve cells. So we know that dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's missing in the motor system in Parkinson's. Well, norepinephrine is the neurotransmitter that drives the heart rate. Uh, and uh, a person who uh, does not have Parkinson's disease, when you um, label them with MIBG, it labels the nerve endings of uh, nerves that transmit norepinephrine. 
Um, and this is a rough outline. You'll see a little bit of the lungs here, and the, this is big black thing here is the liver here, right underneath the diaphragm, and this horseshoe-shaped structure here, that's the wall of the heart. Now heart, remember, is an empty chamber so that the middle of it doesn't have very much um, radioactivity. All the radioactivity of the MIBG collects in the heart. So this is a normal heart on an MIBG study. You look at somebody with Parkinson's disease, particularly somebody who has a low blood pressure, and you see that um, this uh, is all gone. We just a blank space here. There's no uptake whatsoever of this MIBG radio tracer uh, indicating that the nerves that supply the heart are gone. Uh, they have disappeared, much like the nerves disappear in the motor system, uh, leaving a deficit of dopamine. Uh, and the point being that this is one of the mechanisms by which the cardiovascular system fails to respond normally in people with Parkinson's disease uh, because they've lost the innervation, the nerves going to their heart. Everybody understand this concept? So it's not just uh, what's going on in the brain, but there are other nerves involved in the failure of the uh, circulation system in people with Parkinson's. Okay, so that's the background of the circulatory system and some inkling of why or how it is affected in people with Parkinson's disease. We're going to get into some more practical information now. As a result of 24-hour ambulatory studies, that is to say, people who have their blood pressure measured at multiple points throughout the course of the day, we've learned a lot about how the circulatory system is affected in Parkinson's disease. And here are some, uh, here are some results of some of the studies. Uh, overall, there's a general lowering of blood pressure in people with Parkinson's. Uh, and people have pointed out, some authors have pointed out that whereas as we age, by and large, our blood pressure tends to drift upward, in people with Parkinson's disease, their blood pressure tends to drift downward. Overall, as a trend, the average blood pressure in people with Parkinson's tends to gradually lower. And I have to tell you, my own experience corroborates that because I've had a number of people over the years tell me, people with Parkinson's tell me, I don't have to be, I've, I've stopped my blood pressure medication, my internist or my primary care physician told me I don't need it anymore. And that's a very common story that people who used to have high blood pressure have gradually drifted down into a normal range again and don't need to be treated for high blood pressure again. So there's a general trend of diminution of blood pressure over time with Parkinson's, which is the opposite of most people's experience. Another thing, orthostatic hypotension, which is a major problem. I'm going to get back to that in a moment because this requires uh, requires more uh, thought than just on this slide. Postprandial hypotension is a similar kind of uh, phenomenon. It is a, an intermittent hypotension, remember, is low blood pressure. Postprandial means after meals, after meals, and the blood pressure goes down because when you eat a meal, your intestine says, hey, I've got a lot of nutrition for the body, and your vascular system, your cardiovascular system, is supposed to respond to that by sending more blood to the intestines to pick up these nutrients. That's a normal reflex. After we eat, more blood flow goes to the intestine. That's a purposeful design. We want that to happen so we can take advantage of as much nutrition out of the food that we eat as possible. Unfortunately, for people whose uh, vascular system, whose circulatory system, is compromised, diverting blood to the intestine means there may not be enough for uh, uh, circulation to the brain, and you may get symptoms that I'll get to in just a moment, but symptoms of hypotension. <clears throat> People with Parkinson's are vulnerable to hypotension, low blood pressure from a variety of drugs. Some of those are the drugs that we use to treat Parkinson's disease. Uh, in the, in the um, package insert, the little uh, unreadable printed thing that you get with your medications out of the pharmacy, uh, which is the document that describes the, the various aspects of the drug, including the side effects. Um, uh, low blood pressure is listed as a side effect of levodopa, of Cinemet. Uh, it's probably more common, in fact, a number of studies have shown low blood pressure is more common <coughs> in dopamine agonists. So that's Primipexil or Mirapex, that's Ropinol, Roll or Requip, that's Nupro, uh, Rotigotine, uh, 
uh, and uh, apomorphine or apican. Uh, so those are the four dopamine agonists that we have on the market in the United States uh, for, for Parkinson's disease, and they are more likely than levodopa to cause a, a drop in blood pressure. Uh, blood pressure medications themselves, of course, by nature, by, are, they are designed to lower blood pressure, but when they are used in people with Parkinson's disease, uh, they tend to cause an overshoot and drive the blood pressure too far down so that people, again, get symptoms of hypotension. And then there are other drugs, some uh, antidepressants and a variety of other drugs that have low blood pressure as a potential side effect. So uh, one of the things I'm going to tell you to do if you have hypotension is to uh, meet with your doctor and go over carefully all the drugs you're taking, see if there's anything in there that could be aggravating the situation. People with Parkinson's are very prone to wide swings in blood pressure. One study from a few years back uh, of people with Parkinson's who underwent 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring uh, found the majority of them had wide swings of over 100 points. So that means at some point in the day, blood pressure was up around 200, and other points in the day it was down around 100. And those of you who uh, have checked your blood pressure know that those are, that's a very wide swing. Generally speaking, people tend to have blood pressures in the range of between 110 to 150, something like that. We're talking about the first number of the blood pressure, the so-called systolic blood pressure. So if your ideal blood blood pressure says 120 over 80 uh, or 120 over 70, the 120 would represent the systolic blood pressure. Anyway, uh, so you can imagine that in the course of a day, the blood pressure could be both too high and too low. If it goes up to 180, that's too high, that's hypertension, and if it goes down to 80, it's hypotension, that's too low. And people start to get symptoms of hypotension, typically be below a reading of 90. So. Does that swing correspond to times you take your medication? No. These swings are random, randomly occurring throughout the course of the day. Unpredictable, uh, random drifts in blood pressure, which makes it very difficult to devise any type of strategy to, um, to mitigate against either high or low blood pressure because it's very easy in those folks to either drive it too high or drive it too low. Uh, nocturnal hypertension. So normally when um, uh, people without Parkinson's disease, for example, get uh, 24 ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. You see that in the evening there is a drop when people go to sleep. There's usually a drop in blood pressure, so-called dipping, nocturnal dipping, a decrease in the blood pressure at night. And people with Parkinson's do not get that dipping and often have the reverse, that is to say an increase in their blood pressure while they're sleeping. So they get uh, hypertension at night. <clears throat> are, are you going to talk about what a person feels when he's experiencing hypotension or hypertension. Yes, I am. Good. <laughs> Reduced hypodynamic responses when exercising. That is to say, when people work out, uh, their blood pressure or, and their heart rate does not increase the way it normally would. You know, when you go for a jog or something, you're driving up your heart rate. Uh, in fact, a lot of uh, spinning exercises, for example, are geared toward how much you increase your heart rate. Well, people with Parkinson's can be frustrated when they go to a spinning class and they find they're not driving their heart rate up enough be, uh, to satisfy the, um, the instructor. Uh, and uh, even though they're pedaling as hard as they possibly can, the, the, um, the mechanism is not there. You saw that, uh, that uh, picture where the heart was no longer being supplied by the nerves that drive up the heart rate. Well, if you don't have those nerves, you can't drive up your heart rate. And so um, there is a reduced response when exercising. And so people can become fatigued uh, and, and, and lose stamina, which is a very common manifestation of Parkinson's disease, not have the endurance that they use to have uh, because their, their circulatory system can't keep up with the demand that the vigor of the exercise demands. So normally there is an increase in our uh, blood flow to meet the needs of our muscles. For example, when you're, when you're working, your muscles consume more oxygen and more uh, sugar per unit of time, and so you're supposed to be ramping up the supply of those things to uh, your muscles, but if you can't ramp up your heart rate, that limits the amount you can compensate for that uh, increase in, in metabolic need by your muscles. 
so now we're going to talk about how, what do you feel when you get hypotension. So how do you know you have hypotension? Well, the classic manifestation is lightheadedness or dizziness. People get up from a chair and they feel lightheaded or get up from lying down, particularly first thing in the morning if they've been horizontal all night long and they finally stand up and they get lightheaded. Or feeling dizzy, again, similar kind of sensation if you will. Actually fainting or passing out. People feel lightheaded feel like they might pass out and they feel, oh, I've got to sit down, I've got to lie down. Because they recognize that lying down uh, equilibrates their circulation and that, w that way it's just as easy for the heart to pump blood to the brain as to the legs uh, and therefore they're instantly revived by the increase in, in uh, blood circulation. But people can reach a point where they actually lose consciousness if there's a sustained loss of <coughs> blood flow to the brain. <clears throat> Fatigue. Sometimes people don't feel necessarily lightheaded, but they just feel don't feel they have the energy to do things. And fatigue is a common problem in Parkinson's. And one of the things that I look for as a physician when somebody is fatigued is: is there any evidence that this person is suffering from too low a blood pressure? <clears throat> Leg weakness is very common. People feel, I'm weak in the knees, I'm, my f legs feel rubbery. That's a common description for people who have low blood pressure to describe when they're walking around and their blood pressure is dropping. Vision can also be affected. Some people describe a sort of a graying out effect uh, where the color vision particularly is lost. And it's not completely black, uh, but it's gray and um, uh, it's sort of a, bl uh, uh, a grayish black and white world, if you will. Feeling sweaty, going into a cold sweat is a common uh, manifestation of people whose blood pressure is too low. Or to uh, observers feeling clammy to the touch, which usually is a, a, an objective correlate of a cold sweat, if you will. People feel damp, but they don't feel hot. <clears throat> Confusion, mental sluggishness, and this is an area where we are acquiring more knowledge all the time that one of the manifestations of people having low blood pressure can be a confusional state. And people look otherwise alert, but they're just not sharp mentally. Uh, and that's another uh, thing that triggers me to look at somebody's blood pressure as a possible culprit when they have problems along those, those uh, lines. Uh, episodes of unresponsiveness without actually fainting and passing out. So the, the consciousness is lost in the sense of people are not responding to the speech, but they don't actually drop. They still have the, the muscle tone to remain upright, usually sitting. And then finally, is there a, there's a peculiar description of pain in the neck and across the shoulders. This is why it's called coat hanger pain. It has a sort of the, the shape of a coat hanger uh, on the back of a person's uh, body. And it's a, a, a very... Um, characteristic area is not a common uh, symptom of low blood pressure, but when uh, I hear uh, something like that, and uh, of course other clinicians as well, when we hear a description of somebody having pain in that area, we think, well, maybe that could be low blood pressure as well. So this is a, obviously a wide variety of different things that people experience. I think dizziness and lightheadedness would be uh, common to most people, and these are, all these other things are mentioned by individuals. Yes? Burning ears. Burning ears. So uh, the the comment is that uh, this is during uh, low blood pressure. Yeah. Yes. So this gentleman has during uh, uh, episodes of low blood pressure a burning sensation in the ears, which I imagine would be uh, something analogous to this coat hanger pain, a a localized area of uh, discomfort um, that. Is, it turns out to be a manifestation of low blood pressure. So thanks for that input. Okay, I'm promised to get back to orthostatic hypotension because for a couple of reasons. Number one uh, being that uh, if people with Parkinson's experience uh, any of these disorders of blood pressure regulation, this is uh, clearly the most common. And even if people have other uh, problems like nocturnal hypertension and so on, they usually have that in conjunction with orthostatic hypotension. This is also, the other reason is that this is the best studied aspect of cardiovascular function in Parkinson's disease. This is not new news. We've known about this connection, uh, this relationship between orthostatic hypotension and Parkinson's for, for decades. But the term means uh, um, uh, uh, a low blood pressure when standing upright. Orthostatic, ortho uh, means upright. 
uh, static, sta static means standing. So while standing upright, that's what the orthostatic is about. And the hypotension I've already defined bef before is low blood pressure. So these are folks who, when they assume the upright position, have a drop in blood pressure. <clears throat> and that can appear immediately on standing, which is a more severe form, if you will. People get lightheaded, woozy when they first stand up. Or it can be de delayed manifestation. Uh, or a late manifestation after prolonged standing or walking. So people say after five or ten minutes of walking around, boy, I, my, I get weak in my legs or, or I start to get lightheaded or so on, but not when they first get up. Study, Long-term studies tend to show that people who have delayed uh, orthostatic hypotension over years tend to progress to a point where they have more immediate uh, low blood pressure when they first stand up. So I guess you could look at the delayed version of orthostatic hypotension as a, as a, a lighter version, a, a less severe version of the immediate version. But they basically have the same significance, which is that the reflexes that are designed to maintain our blood pressure when we're upright uh, are failing. Uh, it's just that the people in the lower category, the delayed category, have a little time so that they can get from room to room and so on without suffering any consequences. It's only if they're up for prolonged periods of time that they suffer the consequences. Uh, but orthostatic hypotension, as I say, is the most common cardiovascular complication uh, in Parkinson's disease. So how do we determine somebody comes in, says I'm lightheaded or I'm fatigued or so on, and I think they might have low blood pressure as a cause. How would I investigate that? How would I develop some evidence to support that notion that I'm on the right track? Uh, and there are bedside tests and then there are laboratory tests. And the standard bedside test, and you'll see different versions, but most people have come around to this, to accepting this as a standard uh, uh, a standard protocol for checking whether somebody has orthostatic hypotension. First of all, you have somebody lying supine, that's on their back, lie on their back, allow the body to equilibrate for several minutes. I use three minutes because it's the same number as the standing and so it's, it's a very symmetric uh, thing, but at least three minutes, certainly of lying supine. Check their blood pressure, and that's when it should be at its highest because everything is, everything is uh, on the same level. And the blood pressure we me measure in the, in the arm is part of the upper part of the body that's above the heart. The heart has to pump upward to get blood into the arms. So the arm blood pressure reflects uh, more or less what's going on in terms of circulation up to the brain. So we have people check, lie for three minutes, check their blood pressure then. Then they stand up and check the blood pressure immediately, see what happens to the blood pressure. Have those reflexes kicked in and maintain the blood pressure when they first stood up. Uh, and then check again after standing for three minutes. Three minutes is not long enough to capture all the delayed, all the delayed people, but you will capture some people with delayed orthostatic hypotension after three minutes. Uh, also, it's useful because if somebody's blood pressure did drop immediately, you want to see if they've been able to recover somewhat after three minutes. And sometimes people drop immediately, but after three minutes, their blood pressure comes back up close to normal. Anyway, by and large, we consider a systolic drop of 20, that's the first number, or a diastolic drop of 10, that's the second number, to be abnormal. So 10, 20 or greater in the first number, 10 or greater in the second number is considered abnormal. Your blood pressure should not drop that low, that much, uh, after, uh, after go, moving from a lying to a standing position. Uh, and so that's our, that's our benchmark for uh, a normal reflex a function of blood pressure. And most people who do not have orthostatic hypotension will maintain their blood pressure really within about 10 meter, millimeters systolic reading. They won't drop more than 10. So 20 is a bit generous as far as, um, uh, as, far as a cutoff point is concerned. Uh, there's a more formal laboratory test, and this is probably more appropriate for people who have uh, suspected delayed hypotension. If I don't pick up a, an abnormality within three minutes, for example, but I have somebody who's telling me, you know, by the third hole of the golf course, I'm, I'm, I'm getting woozy, or if I go shopping after 15 minutes, I have to sit down or, because otherwise I feel like I'm going to pass out. Those are people that I think may have delayed testing. There's a laboratory test called the tilt table, and the tilt table starts you off on a 
uh, horizontal plane, as, uh, as you might expect, uh, and they check your blood pressure every minute. So you're, if you're lying for three minutes, you'll get three readings of blood pressure, and then the table will tilt you up to a 70 degree angle, which is enough to, to challenge your uh, cardiovascular reflexes. I don't know why they don't, they, go, they don't go to 90, but they go to 70. That's a standard uh, protocol. And then they measure your blood pressure every minute uh, at infinity, sometimes over half an hour. Um, and you watch and see, is there a gradual trend of downward drift? Is there an immediate trend of downward? Or does the person maintain their blood pressure stable? Uh, anyway, these are the two major tests that we use to diagnose, to prove that somebody has orthostatic hypotension. The good news is there's lots of things that you can do about orthostatic hypotension. So if you're one of these folks who is experiencing lightheadedness when you get up and so on, um, there are a variety of things that you can do. If you have the immediate type, the immediate type of postural hypotension, orthostatic hypotension, you get up slowly. Most people learn this on their own. They realize, oh, if I get up too quickly, if I get up too quickly, I'm going to get dizzy or I'm going to feel weak-legged weak and so on. So they learn to get up slowly and gradually, but for people who uh, may not suspect it, they have one of the more unusual symptoms, for example, and I'm the first person to suggest to them, well, it may be due to your blood pressure, I'll tell them, get up slowly and gradually. Here's one thing that a lot of people don't realize, is that drinking a lot of water helps to counteract the low blood pressure. It just, it just seems to be that the more fluid that you have in your body, the, m the greater uh, amount there is in circulation. If you figure that a certain proportion of your fluid uh, is in the circulatory system, then you just think of it that way and you'll realize that increasing your total body fluid intake will increase your, uh, your circulating fluid as well, which means there's more to get to your brain. If you drink 16 ounces of uh, water rapidly in the morning, you can raise your blood pressure by a much, as much as 40 points. Um, so that's a good one. Over the course of a whole day, you want to be drinking at least two liters or th 72 ounces. Uh, 72 ounces is actually two quarts, not two liters. Sorry about that. Um, of water per day, but it's about the same. Uh, that increases your, so, no, it's two quarts is what? 64 ounces, I'm sorry. So two liters is about 72 ounces of water per day. Um, so along with fluid though, you have to increase your salt intake because in the body, fluid tends to follow where salt is. If you don't take in salt, uh, that water, you're just going to be peeing that out in a matter of a couple of hours. So you take salt, and the salt helps, to, helps you to retain the fluid within your body. And you remember that we tell people with high blood pressure to cut back on the amount of salt that they take. We tell people with low blood pressure to increase the amount of salt that they take. And this is the reason why, because salt determines how much fluid you can retain in your body. Elevate the head of your bed by 6 to 12 inches. That's not propping up on pillows. That's inclining your bed, the whole mattress, if you will, so you, you're, in, you're propping up the bed frame. Why does that work? Well, it so happens that your kidneys release a hormone that helps to um, keep your blood pressure up, and if you go completely horizontal, you remove that stimulus for the kidneys to produce that hormone, and so your, 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 your blood pressure um, uh, regulation from your hormonal system diminishes. So by keeping your bed at an angle, it, it, it uh, still allows some tension on the kidneys to produce that hormone. Eat small meals. Remember I said that people with uh, postprandial hypotension can develop low blood pressure because their blood flow is diverted to the intestines to digest. So if you eat smaller meals, you will reduce that tendency for the blood flow to be diverted to the intestines all at one time. Eat more, small meals more frequently rather than large meals. Physical maneuvers, tightening your leg muscles, going up on your toes, crossing your legs, these are things that um, produce pressure in your lower extremities and that helps to prevent the blood from pooling in that area. Basically you're almost squeezing toothpaste out of a tube, if you will, by, by squeezing your legs. So anything that involves muscular activity in your legs or, or crossing your legs to, to clamp them together can uh, temporarily uh, increase your blood pressure. Uh, that's something that, um, what is it, the, uh, the changing of the guard at uh, Buckingham Palace, for example, the, the, uh, the uh, soldiers have to stand there for hours without moving a muscle, are taught to um, tighten their leg muscles to prevent them from uh, going into a faint, uh, for, to prevent them from fluid uh, um, 
accumulating in the lower parts of their body. A similar kind of thing can be accomplished with compression stockings. So these are high tension uh, stockings that are very tight on the lower extremities or an abdominal binder, the same thing. Basically you're squeezing or preventing um, blood from accumulating in lower parts of your body, keeping more of it in circulation. Avoid heat. Heat causes your your blood vessels in your skin to dilate and you perspire to get rid of uh, excess uh, fluid because that cools you off, but diverting the blood flow to your skin is the same as diverting blood flow to your intestines after eating. It just means there's less to get to your brain. Uh, so hot baths, saunas, spa, hot spa, so on, hot tubs. Uh, avoid sitting or lying around for prolonged periods. Your autonomic nervous system uh, has, uh, is like your muscular system. It needs to be uh, in shape, needs to be trained, uh, and uh, keeping it tested and, and working uh, will help over the long run in keeping it working properly. Gentle exercise, too much exercise, and your blood flow will be diverted to your muscles, uh, but exercise is important for keeping your, your muscle tone, of course, ge for general health uh, in your Parkinson's disease. Self-tilt exercises involve <coughs> leaning against a wall like this, with your feet about a foot and a half away from the bottom of the wall and you're again exercising your autonomic nervous system to various uh, body postures. Water is a very helpful place to uh, exercise because of a number of reasons. <clears throat> One being that the pressure of the water uh, acts a little bit like the uh, compression stockings, the abdominal binder. So it helps prevent accumulation of fluid in your lower body. The water itself keeps your body cool so that when you're exercising you don't overheat and divert too much blood to your skin. Water uh, exercise is also more efficient than air exercise. Think of walking across a pool. If you walk 30 feet across a pool, for example, you're, you're expending more energy, you're working harder by working against the water than you are walking 30 feet uh, through the air. Uh, and I, for those of you who have balance problems, of course, the, another advantage is you fall in the water, you get wet. You don't break your hip, you don't break your neck, and so on. Yes. Well, those are advocated. Uh, I don't have any research data to. Um, to give you to back that up, but I know that experts in the field of um, high, uh, orthostatic hypotension uh, always advocate that people do these tilting exercises. So I'm passing that on to you, but I don't have a, I don't have good um, numbers to argue for that. So. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, avoid coughing and straining. Uh, that uh, tends to prevent, if you uh, are, are, are straining uh, or coughing, that prevents blood flow from returning into your chest, of course, where your heart lies. Um, if you feel any symptoms of orthostatic hypotension, please review your medications uh, with your doctor. Let them know that you're experiencing those symptoms uh, and that you know that people with Parkinson's disease are prone to low blood pressure uh, and and you're concerned that maybe some of your medications are, are causing you those symptoms. <clears throat> Uh, if you have any symptoms along these lines, I'd recommend you get an automated blood pressure cuff. Uh, uh, an automated cuff will pump the uh, cuff up for you. Uh, and the biggest advantage of this is that um, it gives you a, um, a predictable reading, a, a um, reliable uh, com comparison from reading to reading because it's the same machine that's doing all the readings uh, and um, uh, you're going to be wanting to monitor your blood pressure uh, over a period of time. <clears throat> you record your blood pressure and your pulse when you're lying down and then again after you've been standing for three minutes. That's the standard test for orthostatic hypotension. Uh, do it at the same time every day so that for comparison purposes uh, you have roughly the same um, uh, type of activity uh, and meal time and medication time to compare with, if you will. Uh, and especially if you're changing your treatment, 
uh, to see if there's any effect of taking away or adding uh, the, the old treatment or the new treatment. Uh, if you have any symptoms of orthostatic hypotension, the dizziness, lightheadedness, and so on, record not only the symptoms but the time of day. And that'll all be helpful when you have your discussion with your doctor. The, remember that the goal of treating the orthostatic hypotension is to get rid of the symptoms. Uh, so in that sense, your symptom record can be even more important than the actual blood pressure numbers that you get, although the blood pressure, help, uh, blood pressure numbers help to tell if there's a trend uh, 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 of your blood pressure migrating in one direction or another. If these conservative measures, these non-medication measures fail, uh, we do have a number of medications that can help. I try to avoid uh, adding medications. Most folks who have orthostatic hypotension are already on a number of medications. I try not to add to that burden. So if we can solve the problem with those conservative measures I, I mentioned on the previous slides, great. If not, there are medications available. Uh, Droxydopa and midodrine are both medications that clamp down on blood vessels and they help raise blood pressure that way. These are drugs that need to be taken during the daytime uh, and avoid taking them at night because they will raise your blood pressure and as I mentioned before people with Parkinson's are prone to high blood pressure at night so these will aggravate that problem. You don't want your blood pressure too high as well as you don't want it being too low. Flugocortisone or Fluoronef is a hormone that um, uh, causes your kidneys to retain more, more uh, sodium and so sodium being a, a key ingredient in salt so that helps you retain fluid. So people with um, low fluid volumes for example are often put on flugocortisone to help boost up the amount of fluid that they have in circulation. Pyridostigmine is actually a drug that's used for myasthenia gravis. Uh, it blocks, uh, uh, it blocks a, an enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. I'm not sure exactly how it functions in uh, orthostatic static hypotension, but that's another one that is used uh, re relatively frequently. Uh, my point is not to uh, teach about medication so much as to say that there is uh, medication help available. So there's a lot of things you can do about orthostatic hypotension short of taking medication as well as taking medication. So the things, the messages I wanted to convey to you today, number one, uh, cardiovascular complications are common. We're learning more about them all the time uh, and we're realizing that people with Parkinson's disease frequently suffer from a lot of these uh, complications, particularly low blood pressure. That's the one that really <coughs> seems to uh, affect most people. So if you have symptoms of hypotension, please be aware of them, make a note of them, keep track of them, make sure that they're not getting worse, uh, and make sure that they're a subject of discussion next time you see your primary care physician or your neurologist uh, uh, as to whether you need to do something about them. <clears throat> and uh, if you do have these symptoms, be sure to uh, review your, your medications with your primary care doctor. Remember that doctors are under increasing pressure to um, uh, drive down blood pressures. As mentioned before, there's been a gradual trend toward more aggressive treatment of blood pressure, classifying more and more people as having high blood pressure and treating them with medication to drive down their blood pressures. The notion behind this is, is noble. We're trying to cut down on um, heart attacks and strokes. And in a large, to a large extent, and the complications of those, and to a large extent, we've been successful in that regard. So this has been a very uh, useful exercise. However, uh, again, in medicine, in the human population, not, uh, one size doesn't fit all. And people with Parkinson's disease are prone to side effects and complications of that. Note also that with coming mandates, uh, where there's going to be uh, performance clauses in physicians' contracts, they're going to be um, uh, their their income is going to be tied to their ability to meet certain benchmarks as far as treating public health problems like high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and so on. Uh, there's going to be even more impetus, is what I'm trying to say, even more impetus to treat people with high blood pressure. And if you're one of those people with Parkinson's disease with these wide swings in blood pressure, as the majority of people with Parkinson's are, and you randomly happen to have your blood pressure measured when your blood pressure is high, you're going to get treated for high blood pressure, even though later in the day, your blood pressure may drop on its own down below to a hypotensive level. So you have to be very careful and mindful uh, of that. 
Uh, it's also true that at this stage of our, our knowledge, it's mostly neurologists who are following this story closely with Parkinson's disease. Non-neurologists may not know that people with Parkinson's are highly, highly vulnerable to low blood pressure. And you may have to be the one to uh, point that out to uh, your physician that you're experiencing symptoms and it may very well be because your blood pressure uh, is going down too low. When it comes to low blood pressure, treat the symptoms, not the numbers. I do encourage you to keep track of your blood pressure. I don't want you to freak out about your blood pressure. I want you to keep track of the numbers so we'll be able to correlate that with any symptoms that you have and we'll establish a pattern that is appropriate for you. And if a treatment is required, then uh, that will mostly depend on how much the low blood pressure bothers you in the way of symptoms as opposed to what your blood pressures are showing. Uh, because the blood pressure tends to swing wide up and down, I'm generally reluctant to add any medication to the mix if I, if I can avoid it. And finally, the good news is there are many things that can be done for low, low blood pressure if you do suffer from symptoms of that. I'm going to throw the floor open to questions. Yes, sir. What do you, how many doctors are we supposed to have? How many doctors are you supposed to have? <laughs> it depends how many kids they have in college. <laughs> It depends on your needs. It depends on your needs. I mean, there are, unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, we're all growing older than we used to as a human race. The, the bad news is that there are a lot of age-related diseases. And so um, you may be prone to arthritis, and uh, you may be prone to high cholesterol, uh, and you may be prone to, and you may have Parkinson's disease. Well, um, I am, uh, I believe, knowledgeable in Parkinson's. Parkinson's, but I can't help you with your arthritis or your um, um, cholesterol. I don't keep up with those medications. I, the, my knowledge of cholesterol is 30 years old from medical school, you know. And, and then, then I learned from my patients who are on high cholesterol. Oh, I'm taking such and such. Oh, really? You know. And half the time I haven't heard of those drugs before because there are new developments in each field all the time. And the proliferation of journals is uh, astounding. Even a neurologist can't read all the neurology journals that are published all the time. That's why we subspecialize in certain areas like in, uh, in movement disorders. Well, now there's four or five different journals that are devoted entirely to Parkinson's disease now, and I can't even read all of them. And you'd think that that's just a very small area of, neuro of, of medicine, and yet it's almost impossible to keep up with things. So the point I'm trying to make is simply that it's very hard for physicians to be uh, expert in a lot of different things. And if you have, if you reach a certain age, you're going to have different problems, and it's to your advantage to have people who are knowledgeable in those areas. Okay? Yeah, ma'am. So in a higher incidence of stroke and heart attack in patients with um, Parkinson's? Is there a higher uh, incidence of stroke and heart attack in people with Parkinson's? No. Yes? What is the applicability of what you said today uh, to other non-Parkinson's movement disorders? What is the apl applicability of this to, uh, of this cardiovascular um, complications to non-Parkinson's movement disorders. Uh, there is an, a similar uh, condition called multiple system atrophy. Uh, it is similar in the sense that it causes Parkinsonism and it causes autonomic nervous system disturbances. Uh, multiple system atrophy, however, tends to be a more aggressive, uh, more rapidly progressive disease, tends to respond much less well to medication. But those folks do have, because by virtue of their autonomic nervous system involvement, do tend to have a lot of uh, cardiovascular complications, possibly even more than people with Parkinson's, but certainly equal to that. So those people can directly benefit from exactly the same kinds of interventions that we use for people with Parkinson's disease. Anybody, uh, however, regardless of whether they have a movement disorder or not, you can get orthostatic hypotension uh, as an isolated phenomenon. For example, you don't necessarily have to have Parkinson's or any other underlying neurological disease, uh, and those folks will all benefit benefit from the same kinds of conservative measures and medications that I outlined here for um, low blood pressure. So it's applicable to a lot of different populations. Yes, at the back? Yeah, well, oh, you said God. That, uh, patients with Parkinson's don't have a higher rate of uh, heart attacks, strokes, yeah, kidney disease. Is there any protective effects from the hypotension? In other words, do Parkinson's patients have less yeah, so, okay, so now the question is the, the, the uh, corollary to the previous question, do people with 
Parkinson's have a lower rate of heart attacks, strokes, and other vascular complications? The answer is no. Uh, I reviewed the medical complications of Parkinson's not too long ago. Here did not come across anything that suggested that uh, the blood pressure um, effects, uh, the effects on blood pressure of Parkinson's lead to any kind of protection or any kind of increased risk of uh, these um, vascular complications. So they seem to be pretty much the same and I don't know if that's because uh, some people with low blood pressure have a lower risk and they balance out the people with high blood pressure at night um, uh, or people who are who have wide swings in blood pressure but for whatever reason it has not transpired in the uh, epidemiologic literature that people with Parkinson's have more or less in the way of uh, heart attacks or strokes. Another question? Yes. Dr. Lally, you mentioned that um, from the Adelanto issue area, a person with Parkinson's heart rate won't be raised as much when they're doing exercise. Correct. Now, typically when you're talking about cardiovascular improvement or improving your um, endurance, mm -hmm. you're saying you want to work at a certain percentage of your maximum heart rate. Like, mm -hmm. take, take, when you're on a spinning bike, mm -hmm. work up to 80% of your heart rate. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're working, it, as your Parkinson's progresses, you can work as hard as you've been in the past, but your heart rate won't go up. Mm -hmm. Do you advocate or suggest doing any additional type of exercises or just bearing down and, and, and expending more energy on your exercises to get your heart rate back into that 75 or 80? So, okay, so the point, so the question has to do with the point I was making about when you lose your, uh, the, the nerves to your heart, then your heart can't respond, or it's not, it's not told to respond uh, to an increase in exercise um, intensity uh, the way that uh, it would normally. Uh, and I brought up the, the example in spinning class where instructors routinely will ask you to pedal at a rate that will drive your heart rate up 50% or 75% or <clears throat> something along those lines. And the question is, is there something else that you can do to drive up your heart rate? Uh, and uh, I, I understand that is your question, is that correct? My answer to that is, uh, never mind the heart rate. You're getting the exercise, your muscles are getting the exercise that you need. You do the best you can. You have to forego the fact that your heart rate is never going to get up to the rate that it used to before because you don't have the wiring anymore to make that heart rate go. Uh, as fast as it used to in response to that level of exercise. But the more important thing is the level of exercise that you do, not what your heart rate does. They're using heart rate as a proxy for the amount of exercise that you're doing because when you exercise, your muscles demand uh, a certain amount of oxygen and sugar and the heart responds to that by supplying that. Well, your heart can't respond as well anymore, but that doesn't mean you're not doing the appropriate amount of work. So you do what you can, but uh, you have to ignore the number. If you can't drive it up, you can't drive it up. Yep. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Is it ever used to use a pacemaker? Is it ever used to? Uh, so the question is, can you override the, the deficit in heart rate uh, with a pacemaker? Well, you could, but uh, what we're talking about is a, an acceleration of heart rate it, to meet the needs of, uh, exor uh, of the exercise. You really wouldn't want to have a, a pacemaker that is constantly driving you at a, an excessively fast rate. Most pacemakers are designed to, um, to have your heart beat at a relatively low rate, of around 60 to 72, uh, which is a nice healthy rate that athletes tend to enjoy. Uh, and you really don't want to be driving your heart uh, excessively. The heart rate, as I mentioned, is just being used as a measure of effort. But if, you're, if, that, if that connection is broken down and it's no longer measuring the effort, uh, the answer is not to, to um, 
to increase the heart rate, uh, the answer is to measure the effort in some other way that you're measuring uh, what the person is actually doing in the form of exercise as opposed to using their heart rate as a measure of how much they're exercising. So uh, that's almost like putting uh, a, 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 a um, camouflage over the problem, if you will, uh, and if you drive up the heart rate, then you can just sit on the bike and not pedal at all and your heart rate will go up. So that's really, not, that's, that's really not accomplishing the goal that you want, which is to get the exercise. Yeah? The uh, amount of water you drink in the morning, mm -hmm. could you substitute something like coffee or tea for the water? So the question is about uh, uh, the advice to drink 16 ounces of uh, water as quickly as possible in the morning. Can you substitute with some other fluid? To a certain extent, you can. Uh, tea you mentioned is a, has a, some diuretic um, content to it uh, and uh, kind of defeats the purpose of you trying to retain the water, if you will. You don't want to be uh, encouraging your kidneys to pee it out. But it's not, it's not zero. So yes, it, it has certainly has value over not drinking anything at all. Uh, but pure water uh, or something like Gatorade particularly or some other type of electrolyte solution, I don't want to endorse one particular product, but there's a lot of them on the market, uh, um, some type of electrolyte solution would be better than tea or coffee. I'm going to have to cut it off there because we have to vacate the room. Thank you very much for coming.